Hello everyone and welcome to Tabletop Tea Time, the monthly show where I invite a load of creators on to talk about a topic, to talk about whatever they want board game related. We're going to mix things up this month and actually jump straight into our creator spotlight. Every month I invite a creator to be interviewed by myself with some rapid fire questions and well this month it's none other than Room 51's Matthew McHack to answer these rapid fire questions. Hey Oliver, thank you for having me on this interview. I am ready for your rapid fire questions. I love the energy, you're gonna need that. Who are you and what's your channel all about? My name is Matthew McHack uh, from Room 51. Our channel is all about uh, talking about board games, we do some board game briefs where our like really quick reviews, uh, so a quick overview and a quick uh, what are our thoughts <laughs> on the game. But we also strongly talk about uh, advocacy within the board gaming space uh, with a focus on LGBTQ plus folks. So we're, we're also, we're all always talking about like social issues and uh, things within board gaming while also just playing board gaming live on streams, uh, so we'll just do running playthroughs, having a goofy, fun time. That's really what Room 51 is all about. What's your favorite game and favorite mechanism? My favorite game uh, for right now, as of this recording, I feel like it changes all the time uh, what my favorite game is, but I, I think I'm going to go with Zaya Legends of a Drift System being my favorite game of all time as of this moment right now. <laughs> Uh, but my favorite mechanism, I think, would have to be deck building slash pool building, uh, or, uh, not pool building, uh, bag building. Um, if I had to really choose between deck building and bag building, because they're, they're kind of similar, but there's, there's differences. Um, I don't know, I really like both of them. I'm gonna say both. Picking two? That's cheating already on these rapid-fire questions. But what game has the best meeple in it? Okay, the game that has the best meeple, I think, is Tiny Epic Quest, because that was the first board game to utilize, well, at least I think, was the first board game to utilize uh, meeples as something uh, that, that had, like, these holes in them where they can actually hold... Um, objects so you could plug in like different weapons and stuff into these meeples so they were really useful uh, which was cool so I like that that the meeple can actually hold different weapons and it made sense in the game like you had to know which meeple had which sword or potion or whatever so that one I think has the coolest meeples and really like changed the course of meeple history what game did you play last the last game I played was Lurkan. I just played that last night, actually. We went to uh, an event at a local uh, board gaming cafe, a uh, board game cafe. And uh, yeah, I've been playing so much Lurkan recently. I think it's my most played game in the past like two years, <laughs> um, maybe three. Uh, but yeah, I've been playing a lot of Lurkan. That's some pretty big hype for Lurkan. I still need to try that. What other hobbies do you have? Other hobbies I have are uh, painting miniatures, although uh, I have to say I've been really bad about that. <laughs> I haven't painted in a while. Oh, that's not true. I just uh, finished uh, some zombicide stuff for a friend. Uh, but I really like doing that. Um, I like building Legos. That's a lot of fun for me. And I guess, I don't know if this is a hobby, but I really like recreational sports especially when the weather's there so i'm in i live in new york uh so the weather is we, we have all four seasons um and so when the weather is nice i really like going out and like playing uh sports recreationally my favorite being tennis that's my favorite but i'll play pretty much any sport i think um and i have a lot of fun with that so i don't know do i have any other hobbies oh i guess uh just painting in general um so like i like making abstract acrylic paintings although that i really haven't done in a very long time i should really get back into that uh life is so busy oh my gosh um but those are those are some other hobbies that i have i could never quite get into painting myself and to be honest my old attempts at warhammer will pretty much prove my lack of skill there but what's coming to your channel in the next few weeks in the next few weeks of my channel, um, you could 
definitely expect us to be uh, live on Twitch. Uh, so that's Room 51 Live, uh, that you could check it out there, where we do live playthroughs of board games and just a lot of nonsense and shenanigans go on and uh, us talking with the community. Uh, as for our YouTube channel, um, you could probably most likely see um, a, a fairly new segment uh, where I do spoken word uh, poetry that is inspired by particular board games. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. I've been making that. Uh, Hopefully those come out in the next few weeks. I don't know. Um, but probably more board game briefs, so reviews on some games, uh, really brief ones. And uh, I'm hoping to do some more queer reviews. So that's where I talk about uh, board game, uh, if, it, if there could have been queer representation in the board game. Does it have it? Uh, if not, why not? If it does, these are the ways it does. Uh, so those are fun to make. I like that. And then if they could get a seal of queer approval from Room 51, uh, which is fun. Uh, I think that would probably be the bulk of things. I'm trying to think. Can I do anything? Maybe some mind over metas, uh, too. That's where I, I talk about, like, that's uh, a lot of where I talk about, like, social issues as it pertains to board gaming um, and... Uh, psychology as well, because I'm a therapist by day and night, and a board gamer by day and night, <laughs> and so uh, I intertwine those things. But yeah, that's that's it. Awesome! Well, thank you very much, Matthew, for being our Spotlight Creator this month. Thanks again for having me, Oliver. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for the interview. Uh, hope to catch you next time. Bye! And now on with the rest of the show, and I'm going to pass straight over to Josh. Hi, I'm Josh from the YouTube channel Josh Yaks, where I talk primarily about hobby-related topics like board games and books. And I've been pretty fortunate in that over the years I've been able to acquire pretty much any game that I would consider to be a grail game. And even when I had to sell my War of the Ring Collector's Edition due to financial reasons, I was still, some years later, able to acquire the Anniversary Edition and its expansions, which I'm more than happy with. So there's not a lot out there that I would necessarily consider to be a grail game if i did have to pick one it would not be a game but an expansion and it would not be an available expansion but an expansion that unsuccessfully crowdfunded so it never did make it to the market and that is the expansion for a game called kings of air and steam the expansion being world's fair i think it was called so kings of air and steam is a game by scott alms it is a pick up and deliver kind of economic game based around a programming mechanism where you have to pre-plan your movements and players also have asymmetrical abilities which is always something that appeals to me so this is a game that has been a favorite of mine for many years years since it first came out so I was very excited when the World's Fair expansion w was on I think it was Kickstarter was a crowdfunding platform they used but because I have played this game so much over the years that I've kind of played it out to a certain extent although I still enjoy playing it but the expansion would have breathed new life into this game and I was so crushed when it failed to reach its crowdfunding goal so if I have a grail it is this hope that someday the World's Fair expansion for Kings of Air and Steam will be successfully brought to the market. I really hope that Scott Alms is able to someday find a publisher to make this happen. It would make me happy anyways. Cheers. Over my time in the gaming hobby, my grail game has changed a few times. In part because I've either managed to play something that I really wanted to and really thought I needed in my collection, or maybe it's something that I have actually managed to pick up. Now, for me, a really useful way of picking up a grail game, and a couple that come to mind were the sort of Battlestar Galactica game, or even the Carcassonne Winter Edition, I picked both of these up, not at the same one, but at different conventions. I found this really useful when trying to look for a game that was quite expensive on the art sort of second-hand market, it's not in print anymore, and I think a lot of people's grail games are either really expensive, just generally, or they're expensive because the only way you can get them anymore is second hand. But I found getting a reasonable price at a convention was possible for these. Now, first of all, one of them I got at Essen Spiel. Now, that is a huge convention over here in Europe, 
And well, they have huge opportunities, but sort of ahead of time with not so much like a made for thing at the convention, but on like Board Game Geek, they have threads for trades, different type of trades, math trades, where you sort of put in what you want, what you have, and between loads of you, hopefully that works out and you can actually be part of the trade. Or there's other ones where people just list games that they're looking to sell and sort of are willing to bring to that convention. Also another place was UK Games Expo that I saw some people picking up games they really had been after that they couldn't get hold of from like the actual there bring and buy sale. So there's a couple of ways that you can get hold of them and that's how I've got hold of Battlestar Galactica and the Pegasus expansion and then also the winter edition of Carcassonne. Carcassonne's one of my favourite games and I always wanted the winter one to be able to play at Christmas. It just felt like it, it worked and you know what? It's a real blast getting it off the shelf sort of every wintry season. But at the moment, I do have a Grail game that's not in the collection. I'm a huge fan of Love Letter and, well, a bit like with the winter edition of Carcassonne, there's a special edition that I really want just to be able to play near Christmas time because AEG actually released a Letters to Santa version of Love Letter. It just, you know, I, I absolutely love Love Letter and the quirkiness, the fun theming around a Christmas version. Oh man, I think that would be really cool. Unfortunately, it's very hard to get hold of. Not many people ever had it. It looks like it's sort of just not out there, even really on a second-hand market. I periodically try and post on the Facebook um, trading, sort of board game trading place in the UK in the hopes that someone might see the post and be actually willing to let it go. I've not had it yet. But yeah, that's sort of where I sit on my Grail games. I've got a couple of them that I wanted to pick up along the way and it sort of just changes. So don't necessarily think this is the one grail game that if I get it it's gonna end collecting in my collection because you're probably just gonna move on to another one but it is sometimes really satisfying when you do get them uh, you know like that winter carcass on it does come off the table at a specific time of the year but it just makes that time of year more sort of special getting a fun game that's themed and stuff to the table so that in, in my head that's that's where that sort of grailness comes from, finding that and getting it, rather than one that's just always just quite out of reach. Normally, because you're priced out of the market. And often you can get a similar game, you know, maybe from a different region or whatever. So don't, don't be put off if you do see your grail game as something really expensive. Try and get it, a, a play in it. Try and find someone that you might be able to play at a convention with. Some people, you know, do Blood on the Clock Tower events. Going to actually buy Blood on the Clock Tower, that's out of reach for a lot of people. So maybe you could sign up and play your Grail game at a convention. Or maybe someone going there might sell it to you. So a little bit of a, a tip there of what you might be able to, to use a convention for. Anyway, that's enough of me waffling on to someone else. Hi, I'm Barb Meeple, PhD. I'm an astronomer and I like to find connections between astronomy and board games. And so in this segment, I am finding unexpected astronomy in non-astronomy themed board games. This time I'm looking at the game Seven Wonders. This is a drafting game where you are building up your society in front of yourself. It's played over three rounds or ages, where during each round you are gonna draft six cards out of an initial hand of seven. Each time you draft a card, you're going to play it out in front of yourself, either face up or face down tucked under a stage in your wonder, or you can discard it to get some money. Each card that you play face up into your civilization represents a different kind of something. It could be resources that are available to you now for the rest of the game, maybe a public building or military might. Uh, it could be trade infrastructure or science advancements. And of course, it was one of those science cards that reminded me of astronomy. And in particular, it was the workshop card. 
Now, I realize most people don't think of workshops when they think of astronomy. You probably think of somebody outside with a telescope, or maybe sitting at a computer using data from one of the space telescopes that are out there. But in order to make those new telescopes, we have to develop new technology, and that is done in laboratories all around the world. And it had me thinking about one of the workshops at work that I've gotten to tour. It's a, it's a workshop that's building X-ray mirror technology. Now, X-ray mirrors don't look anything like a mirror that you might think about for a normal telescope. This is because X-rays pass right through mirrors unless they are going in right, right at this very shallow angle, like skipping a rock. But when you do that, you're basically turning the mirror on its edge. You can do it as a circle, but it means you have this big hole in the middle where you are missing all these x-rays that come through. So what you do is you make a bunch of different smaller and smaller mirrors that go in here in order to fill up that space. But this poses some problems. How do you make those mirrors light enough? What materials are the best materials to use in order for the x-rays to you know, reflect like you would like them to onto a detector? And so these are the kinds of things that these engineers and scientists in that lab that I got to, to tour are trying to solve. And I know their workshop looks nothing like the one in Seven Wonders, of course, but the purpose is still the same. It is a place to go and tweak designs in order to advance advance your society's knowledge and appreciation of the universe around you. So the next time you're playing Seven Wonders and the workshop card comes up, take just a moment to think about those x-ray mirrors that are being developed where I work. Thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this little foray into some unexpected astronomy. I'll be back again soon with another video. Uh, you can like and subscribe to my channel if you like this kind of content. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your tea time, and I'll see you next time. And today we're going to end with Evan going over a game that I cannot see anyone ever have heard of or played before. And as he's going to sort of allude to, the theming is not necessary for everyone. He's going to give you a little bit of a warning of why you might not want to know about the game. So let's pass over to him. The following segment may contain material that could be considered inappropriate to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey everybody, I'm Evan. And today I'm going to show you a game that you have probably never heard of. So, in my constant hunt for strange and unusual games, every once in a while I come across one with a theme that is so bizarre and so interesting <laughs> that I cannot resist tracking it down. Um, so, today's pick is going to be a game from Japan, and it's called Libido. Um, this is an adult-ish themed game, but there's nothing adult explicit in the game. However, what you're doing in the game um, could possibly be inappropriate for some audiences. So, uh, full disclosure, I've never actually played this game, and we'll talk about that afterwards um but uh let's go down below and i'll show you what i know about this game so in a game of libido you are playing as brothers who live in a house and the goal of the game is to acquire as many dirty magazines uh, things like of that nature and hide them in your house so that your other brothers which are the other players do not find them and then your mother also doesn't find them when she's cleaning your room <laughs> so um everyone is given a hand of two separate cards destination cards and hiding place cards destination cards are what you use to go acquire the uh the adult materials such as your other brother's rooms uh like convenience store book stands the riverbank um, adult store, those type of those these types of places. Then uh, you have to bring those things home and find a hiding place for them, like uh, under your bed, in your drawer, closets, uh, under your desk. I think uh, mixed in with your other uh, other books, I suppose. You can hide them in your briefcase or among your DVDs. <laughs> um, so 
Then there are uh, the cards that represent uh, the adult materials that you find. So there's DVDs. There is uh, uh, picture books. There are slightly naughtier picture books. Uh, slightly less naughty picture books. Posters. Uh, and I believe uh, manga, which is probably not that uh, offensive at all. Um, and then you have a, a libido track up here and a courage track. Um, then your mother's mood track will be affected uh, by this die roll here. So like, it depends on how aggressive she's going to be. Like when she's cleaning or searching for the things you shouldn't be having in your room. Um, and then there's these sort of action cards, which I'm not 100% sure how they work. But they, uh, they can help deflect or acquire. Because I think this is you're getting a gift from um, from someone of something that's inappropriate or like this is for snooping in your brother's rooms rainy days I th don't think you can go to any of the outside locations um, I think this is stealing uh, some materials from your brother's rooms uh, I believe this is distracting your mother with uh, your good test scores so she doesn't come snooping um, this is a well that's a mysterious stain uh, these are some notes from your mother, and I think you can distract your mother uh, with bugs because then she's, not, she's worried about the bugs in your room and not uh, the other things. And, uh, yeah, things like that. So, there is not a single bit of English in this game. I've done some rough translating, but um, I've never, you know, I haven't, like, printed anything out to actually play the game. <laughs> there are a total of three owners of this game on Board Game Geek and zero plays. So this is a rather rare game that was, uh, you know, very independently produced to the fact that, you know, like you can see this board is a little warped. It's just kind of like printed photos, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, this is the exact sort of thing that uh, I enjoy having in my collection. Um, even though it's very odd and inappropriate so i don't <laughs> i don't know much else to say about the game so let's go back up and we'll uh we'll finish this up so there you have it that's a general idea of how i think you probably play <laughs> the game libido um this is a game that i have never played this is a game that i probably never will play and the reason is, it is a three to six player game. Generally, I play games with my family, and that includes, you know, my 11 and 14 year old son. So I don't know that I would feel comfortable pulling this out and playing it with them. So I mostly keep it in my collection because it's such an oddity. <laughs> and quite an oddity it is. Um, <sighs> I how the, the next question is, how can you get this game? And the answer is, I don't think you can. This was an independently produced game that was released at Tokyo Game Market in 2016. Um, I found it through a uh, Japanese uh, board game retailer site, and then I used uh, Baiyi, which is a forwarding service, to get it to me. Um, because, you know, come on, I couldn't resist. This is the type of thing that I thoroughly enjoy. I know that probably uh, came across wrong, but um, yeah, weird games, weird themes, I'm all about it. Um, yeah, so um, hopefully that wasn't uh, too rough, but um, yeah, I guess uh, I guess that wraps this segment up for today. I, I, I'm not, uh, not sure where to go from here. <laughs> all right, well, have a lovely tea time, everyone, and well, I will see you next month. And well, that about wraps us up for this tabletop tea time. I hope you've enjoyed. If you have, go back and check out the previous versions of the show. This is episode seven. That means there's six other episodes full of these creators, other creators, and more to talk to you about various board games and board game topics. And there'll be more in the future, so subscribe for that. And while you're doing all that, Check the description box down below as I'll have the links to all of the creators that were on today's show. So go check them out, share the love and all that sort of jazz. And until next time, have a brilliant month gaming.